Steve Marinucci, a freelance writer on Billboard.com, Variety.com, Access.com, Goldmine, and wherever I can put my my byline, um, saying welcome to another Things We Said Today, our weekly talk show where we discuss the Beatles past, present, and maybe to come. Let me introduce my two co-hosts, um, first from the state of Connecticut, the host of the Beatles show, Every Little Thing, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. And the legendary host, former host of the Beatles desk at the New York Times, um, who now writes for the Wall Street Journal and other publications, um, our musicologist and all-time Beatles expert, uh, Mr. Alan Cozen. Hello, Alan. Hello, Steve. Hello, everyone. Today, we're going to talk uh, about the evolution of George Harrison as a songwriter. Um, that's going to be our topic. But first, we're going to get some news out of the way. The first, I guess the, the big news uh, is the fact that the Beatles are going to release a 7-inch uh, Yellow Submarine Eleanor Rigby picture disc single on July 6th to uh, go along with the reissue in the theaters of the movie. And for those who have been wondering if the mixes on the single are going to be anything new, they are not. They're going to be from one and one plus, uh, according to uh, a source uh, I talked to. So, um, but, uh, yep, that's that's what's coming. Um, any of you guys want to comment on that? Well, so in a way, it nice. is new as a single because those those mixes haven't been on a single before. I mean, that's that's pretty minor. Oh, okay. Minor detail, yeah. but... Um, minor detail, you know. right. Yeah. Ken? Just something else for the collector. Yep, yeah. exactly, exactly. Uh, another uh, news was uh, the starting of uh, Ringo's tour. He started uh, um, June 1st in um, Atlantic City. Uh, and... He added a couple of um, songs uh, to the set. Uh, they've cha- they did make some changes. They have Graham Goldman now uh, on the tour, and they brought back Colin Hay. I, I think I, I'm going to run down the set list here in case anybody hasn't heard the whole thing. Starting, And I don't think I have to tell you who sang what, but Matchbox, It Don't Come Easy, What Goes On, Dreadlock Holiday, which is Graham Goldman for anybody that doesn't know. I certainly didn't. Uh, Evil Ways, Rosanna, Down Under, Boys, Don't Pass Me By, Yellow Submarine, I'm Not In Love, Black Magic Woman, Gypsy Queen, You're 16, Anthem, Overkill, Africa, Oye Como Va, I Want to Be Your Man, Things We Do for Love, Who Can It Be Now, Hold the Line, Photograph, Act Naturally, and With a Little Help from My Friends. Uh, anyone want to comment on those songs? Well, I'm certainly thrilled about the three Graham Goldman songs, and I expected I'm Not in Love, and I expected The Things We Do for Love, but the third song, Dreadlock Holiday, was a nice surprise, and that was actually a song that got quite a bit of airplay, on rock radio here it's it's a reggae song in which they sing i don't like reggae so uh i'm sure many people listening to the show know that song so it should be familiar i would i would hope to most but when we were talking about graham goldman earlier when we first heard that he was going to be a new addition we were wondering if any of the songs that he wrote in the 60s -hmm. might be added and apparently not you know like for your love for the yardbirds You know, songs like that. So it's going to be strictly the the 10 CC songs. And it's nice that Ringo brought back Anthem. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many songs in his catalog I wish he would do that he's never done live before, but at least there's that change. Mm -hmm. And something like You're 16, he he did do recently when he toured, but it was the first time in a long time that he did You're 16. I think he felt uncomfortable in his age singing a song with those lyrics, You're 16, You're Beautiful (laughs) in Your Mind. Which is ridiculous. It's just a song. That's yeah. all it is. It was a big right. hit. You know, don't take it so seriously. But right. um, I- I'm very happy with the set list. And everybody else is playing the same songs. And the Colin Hay songs are the same three that he did when he toured with Ringo. And you know he's got to do Who Could It Be Now and Down Under. And I'm so thrilled that he's still doing Overkill, which is a great Men at Work song. Mm-hmm. Wonderful song with 
a great build-up in it too, and uh, works very well live. So, yeah, I'm very happy with the set list. Alan, yeah, it sounds like a nice set list. Um, as as you say, not an awful lot new apart from the Graham Goldman things, and um, you know, some slight changes in uh, in Ringo's set. But it you know, it sounds like a nice show. And, uh, you know, that's that's really all Ringo intends to do. I mean, from the very start in 1989, when when the first one of these tours came out, I mean, I remember I remember what he said about it. He said, you know, we're not trying to break anybody's brains. We just want everyone to have a good time. And, you know, that's a a, a legitimate entertainment world aspiration. So um, I think he does a good job of it. Right. And that's what they've been doing. And it's worked out. It's become a, a a great thing for him. Uh, I you know I really, you know I mean there were other bands doing this ki- kind of thing. I mean you know there were other touring acts that were using this kind of formula, but he's really made it his own. And you know for what it's worth, it's good that he's still out there doing it. Um, he's always said these are the songs you know and love. <laughs> right. But the one thing I must say that I do miss about his shows is that he used to always have. Solo numbers. By that I mean one of the members would come out on stage and do something alone, usually. And um, if you went to two shows in a row, you might get different members of the All Stars doing their own solo numbers. So it would be slightly different. Mm -hmm. And I kind of missed that. It added something Mm -hmm. special. Mm -hmm. Whereas now it's pretty much the same from show to show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's also the uh, there's also a current John and Yoko uh, exhibit, and I believe that's a is that a Beatles story in in Liverpool. I believe that's where that is. Um, that uh, and uh, Yoko and Sean uh, went for the opening of that, um, and there were pictures of them uh, out there, and uh, and they visited uh, uh, Mendips, and uh, it was great. it was great to see Yoko out and about again. Um, I wish I could say we have a report about that, but we don't. But uh, the reports on it are really good, so. Yoko also visited uh, John's home in at uh, Newcastle Road, where mm-hmm. he lived with Julia. Hmm. So it was that that and Mendips. Okay. It's supposed to be the first time she ever went to the home in uh, Newcastle. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Hmm. I think she's been to Mendips before. I think. Yeah, she has. Yeah, she has. But, they have. But yeah, she has. But Newcastle, I think this was the first time. Mm-hmm. And then there's there's I I one day I happened to discover on. Amazon, um, there's an ebook, uh, and it's available in print also. But there's a, a f- ebook that's available free called "Life on Two Legs" by Norman Sheffield. And what attra- got my attention was the book has an introduction by Paul McCartney, and the first chapter is on the recording of "Hey Jude," uh, and it and it mentions actually it mentions Peter Asher very prominently in the in the chapter. But if you are a Kindle person, like I am, and you, you know, you like free Kindle books, I mean, that's something you might want to hunt down. Uh, it's also available on their um, Kindle Unlimited or some, that deal where you pay 10 bucks a month, but you can get it free without it. So, I mean, if you go to uh, Amazon and look, you you may have to kind of move around and, and do some hunting for the free link to buy it. But it is free, so, but it's a it's an interesting book. I I started looking at it, and like I said, Peter Asher is mentioned in the uh, prominently in the first chapter. You should say so, what the book is about. Oh, it, it Norman Sheffield. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Norman Sheffield is the guy who founded Trident Studios, which is why he talks about the uh, the recording of Hey Jude, and it got uh, when I posted it the day I posted it on my. Beatles group, Tony Bramwell chimed in and said that Sheffield had just passed, but and that he was a great guy. So he gave gave kind of a little bit of an endorsement to the book. So there you go. Another exhibit um, that has opened and is running through next March is the uh, Rock on TV exhibit at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and that has a bunch of different things in it, including the stage designs from the Beatles at Sullivan Show. So um, that's interesting. And finally, I'm going to mention this very briefly. I just found out about this the other day. There's a, this album is 
at least five or five years old. I believe it's called Queen's English by the by a surf band called the Malibus, M A L I B O O Z. And what they've done with the album is they've done a bunch of original songs in '60s British Invasion style. But the real kicker here is who's on the album with them. And I was floored when I read this list. It's uh, here's the here's the list: Spencer Davis, Andrew Lou Goldham. Tony Hicks of the Holidays, Chad Stewart and Jeremy Clyde, Colin Hanton, Rod Davis, and Len Gary of the Quarrymen, Peter Jameson and Richard Moore of the Trogs, John Farrar and Mark Griffiths of the Shadows, Noki Edwards of the Ventures, David Carr of the Fortunes and the Ventures, and Ian Whitcomb. The album is available on Amazon. Oh, and the cover shot was taken by Jared Mankiewicz, who did photographs for the Rolling Stones and, and Jimi Hendrix. And the tracks were mastered at Abbey Road. So uh, the album, uh, I, I saw the album today uh, on Amazon. It's there. So if you want a copy of it, um, that's where to get it. So anyway, mm-hmm. we were going to talk about the music of the development of George Harrison as a writer in the Beatles. and In the Beatle years. In the Beatles, well, right, in the Beatle years. Thank you. There's a, I mean, obviously, there's a whole list starting with In Spite of All the Danger and Cry for Shadow, uh, which he co-wrote. And I found it was interesting. I found a, a quote where he talked about um, Cry for Shadow and said that um, they had it, it had been written. He said, someone asked John and myself how the tune went, and we tried to demonstrate. It wasn't a bit like Apache, but we liked it and used it in the act a while. We even called it Cry for a Shadow. Um, but it was it was originally, I think, a, a somewhat of a uh, – George originally had compared it with uh, Apache. So, uh, But the, the title Cry for a Shadow is a reference to the shadows, which is kind of interesting. That's um, – Cute. Well, and the fact that it was an, a, a guitar-driven instrumental, uh, right. sort of in the shadow style, but I think they didn't they say they didn't like the shadows much, so that it, in a way it was sort of a tongue-in-cheek, not not exactly a tribute, but um, mm. you know, a dig. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sort of. I, I you know, it, uh, I I would have trouble totally believing that uh i mean maybe maybe it was but it doesn't sound like a dig to me does it sound like a dig to you guys i don't nice really know for sure because yeah. <laughs> what was that it's again a great instrumental i think it's a great instrumental yeah you know for something that was done that early it really holds up yeah. just by itself and it's um you know it's been used so much for music beds whenever i'm doing anything in radio or hear anything on the beatles on the radio and um, I did want to mention, in spite of all the danger, because I'm sure that you know that Paul said, since um, it's listed as being written by Paul and George, that George really didn't write the song. He just gave him a songwriting credit because he came up with the guitar solo in it. Right. Which could be the same so, as for Cry for a Shadow, except that the guitar solo is the whole thing. <laughs> right. Right. Well, that was uh, that was nice of Paul to... <laughs> To give him the credit, good grief! Um, you know, I mean, well, if he if he gives him the guitar you know, lick, I mean, you know, why wouldn't you credit him? I don't know. That seems weird to me. But well, then why doesn't oh, Paul on. get credit for Taxman? Why is that okay. not a, a Harrison McCartney song? Well, we haven't gotten there yet, so okay. We well, can I turn mean, this into a whole different show, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. You talk That's about true. and I love her and the fact that George came up with that those four notes. Mm-hmm. You know, da 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 da. Mm-hmm. Why didn't he get a songwriting credit there? Okay, okay. Because there was a Lennon McCartney partnership, and they didn't want to interfere with that. So, okay. yeah. Starting with uh, with the Beatles, um, you know, we have "Don't Bother Me," which uh, the the early that list of early songs going through. Uh, from Don't Bother Me, you, you Know What to Do, I Need You, You Like Me Too Much, Think for Yourself, and If I Needed Someone, all to me have a very distinct introspective quality. And 
Uh, I mean, there were Lennon McCartney songs that were somewhat inter, uh, introspect, introspective like that, but not to the extent that these were, at least to me. Um, uh, it's great that, uh, you know, uh, he was very, he got very personal and he wasn't afraid to get personal in his early songs. And, and anybody want to say anything there? Yeah, I don't know that they're that personal. I think he. You know, they give the impression of being personal, like "Don't bother me." I mean, but we don't know if that's if that's really a personal expression or just an idea for a song that he had. You know? Oh, well, um, sure, that's that's true too. I do think that um, those early songs, you know, have a certain sort of tentativeness that where you know he's not so sure about his songwriting, and he even says about "Don't bother me." in um i me mine you know i it's my first song i don't know if it's a song at all um and i think that's going too far it's a song i kind of like it as a song and i think that with those early songs you know while on one hand you can you can sense that he's a little tentative and maybe a little um awed by what john and paul are putting out um i think the fact that you know the arrangements that Beatles did as a group kind of really helped put them over the top. I mean, there's 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 nothing tentative about a performance of like you like me too much, you know. I mean, that's it it, it sizzles in its way. So, um, hmm. you know, and think for yourself. Uh, that's kind of that's kind of interesting. I, I see what you mean by introspective. Given you know, don't bother me. Think for yourself. These kind of. Um, you know, Beach Boys in my room kind of things, which is usually John's yeah. territory. Um, right. They were they were more like they were more like teenage. It was more like teenage stuff, really. You know, kind of like what Brian Wilson again. Well, think what Brian for yourself. Wilson. Think for yourself is a bit beyond that, you know, because it's, right. Yeah. You know, here here he's really that's really pretty assertive, you know. Think for yourself because I won't be there with you, you know. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. But, you know, George has this knack, as we've pointed out before, especially when he got into his solo career about writing songs that could be interpreted as either being for God or for a woman. Think for yourself could have different meanings. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be about a specific relationship. It doesn't even have to be a romantic relationship. Right. It's a relationship that he's struggling with with another person. Mm -hmm. But it could also just be about, you know, think for yourself, think independently. You're on your mm -hmm. own. That kind of an attitude. So, you know, I love the fact that early on, George is writing songs that could have more than one meeting. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, when I, when I think about George uh, in particular, well, you know, it, it's a fascinating thing that even early on, John, Paul, and George, their songwriting styles were very different from each other, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. The songs that George wrote, in most cases... I couldn't really hear John sing or Paul sing. There was so much, they were, they were so George. And even Don't Bother Me, you know, it was so unique and distinctive stylistically and musically. It stands out. You can tell that it's a different song from what John would write or what Paul would write. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I got to give George a lot of credit since he didn't have a songwriting partner all those years. Everything he had to do by himself. Although John was to say that he helped him out with Taxman, you know. But um, for the most part, George had to do everything on his own. Mm -hmm. And uh, You Like Me Too Much is a song that I've really grown to appreciate more now. Very interesting, just the introduction, that rollicking piano intro. Mm -hmm. Kind of unique for its time. But um, even it's kind of comical. You like me too much, but I like you. <laughs> and I like yeah. you. You know, he's always, even then, it's the start of the, the humorous side. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Uh, so, um, yeah, there there are seeds of it early on in those early songs. Mm -hmm. I I really I really like uh, I need to um, that uh, the mix and the the way that the way he used that guitar intro in, in there. I always love that the way he the way he did that uh, with that guitar. Uh, I thought that was uh, pretty beautiful. And if I needed someone, is kind of the same on the same lines. Uh, I really like what he did with both of those songs uh, musically. I have, Alan, one, I have one quibble with what Ken said. I mean, while I basically agree 
that John, Paul, and George all had distinctive styles, and that you know George definitely, even in these early songs, uh, you know those weren't things John or Paul would sing or that you could imagine them singing particularly. But you could say the same thing in a way for do you want to know a secret and I'm happy just to dance with you. I mean, those were Lennon-McCartney songs, but George completely made them his own with his performance. And Mm -hmm. uh, I feel that they're like inseparable from him. And if they had said by George Harrison, I would have believed it. (laughs) See Mm. what I mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, I don't know. I I couldn't think of "Do You Want to Know a Secret" as being written by George. Hmm. I really couldn't. Or even "I'm Happy Just to Dance with You." I could. He- I could actually hear John sing those songs. I know. I, I I again getting back to the the innocence of the lyrics and on the early songs. I I definitely could. I I definitely think that that's a good point. You don't think the innocence in those lyrics is more is is harrison like uh ken no it has more to do with the the musicality and the structure of it and the melody you know even george's melodies are always different Hmm. you know he always stands out between between john and paul you know even early on i think so i mean you think of you like me too much i mean that that melody is so different from what john and paul would write to me Mm mm-hmm mm-hmm he mm-hmm. developed a style that, that was all his own even early on. And then he flourished later on, obviously, later in the Beatles and in his solo career. But even still, I mean, Don't Bother Me sticks out like, like a sore thumb on, with the Beatles as far as I'm concerned. So, In what respect? What do you mean? As far as- it, just sounds, it just sounds so unique as a composition. It doesn't sound like something that John or Paul would write. Hmm, and okay. lyrically, again, he's, you know, George, a lot of what he writes about tends to be on the negative side, even though it could be humorous, like, like you like me too much. But even then, don't bother me. Uh, <laughs> I just yeah. think it's, it's, it's got a great hook to it and just the sound of it. It's just <laughs> very different from other songs on With the Beatles. There are similarities in songs on With the Beatles, but Don't Bother Me kind of sticks out from John John songs or Paul songs. Okay. Okay. I, I see for me I think uh I need you is the one that really sticks out and also if I needed someone but sticks eh. out in what way? Lyrically and, and musically I think they were Are you saying they that's were, that's when he came into his own? No, actually when he came into his own I I, I hold to the these first songs as a as a group. I think lyrically or when he came into his own were the next songs. Mm. I think that's where that okay. was his turning point. Sure. That was his turning point. But I'm I'm in oh. it just in these in these early songs I think um I need you and if I needed someone were were the best. I I I, I think so. I think they were the best of that group. Well you're just talking about the quality of his music. I'm only just talking about his developing a style that was unique and I think he okay. had it from the get go. Okay. Okay. Would both of you agree that Taxman was a very sharp turning point? Sure. Probably. Well, uh, you know, If I Needed Someone was... I think I think the Rubber Soul songs show a lot of growth beyond the ones he did through Help, which were only a few. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I think, you know, on one hand, If I Needed Someone, I mean, musically is really pretty simple i mean again in i me mine he talks about how it's one of many songs that are just based on variations on a d chord you know adding the suspended fourth and taking it off and then you know you, you know how you, you you can do you any you all play guitar right yes mm-hmm. you know so it's just taking that triangular shape of, of a, a a second fret uh, D chord and then moving the top string on and off and adding the pinky on the next fret. It's it's actually a, a nice little trick that the birds did all the time. The hollies did a bit of too, um, which is probably, you know, the birds was was, was probably the sound he was after um, in that when he was writing that and. The Hollies picked it up, and it, it seemed sort of natural for them. Although he didn't seem to like their version very much. Hmm. <laughs> mm. 
well, you mean the bells of Rimney mm-hmm. from the birds, which which George said was an influence right. on uh, if I needed someone. Exactly. Okay. I do feel, though, that Think for Yourself was a leap. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, you know, I need you and uh, you like me too much are nice, and they're, they're about relationships. It's not, they're not deep songs. Think for Yourself lyrically is much deeper and a little bit more complex. Right. He definitely got he definitely got into the musical effects um, a little more there. It, he got a little more psychedelic with that. Definitely. And also, you know, you, you reach a point in that in that middle period, sixty five and sixty six, where the Beatles are talking about their minds, you know. And mm-hmm. there's a great line in "Think for Yourself." Although your mind's opaque, even using the word "opaque" is unique <laughs> in a song. Right. You know, try right. thinking more of just for your own sake. I mean. You know, you're talking about the mind there. You're talking about the brain. And so it's it's a little bit more than just, you know, I like you and you like me or I love you and you love me. There's a little bit more going on there. So Right, right, mm-hmm. right. Um, okay, the next group, I think we'll skip 12-bar original because that really doesn't enter into the discussion at all. But starting with Revolver, we have Taxman, Love You Too, I Want to Tell You. Three very that, different songs. Three very different songs, but also, in my view, a very sharp turn in his development. He really he started to become a lot more competition to Lennon and McCartney at that point. Mm-hmm. And Taxman is you know is pretty outspoken um, right. by, by their standards about a political issue, and you know directly you know name checking British politicians and and everything, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Heath, um, mm-hmm. you know, and and really taking issue with the fact that they were in the ninety five percent tax bracket, which I guess I would take issue with too. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, right. You know, but in, I, I wonder, I, I'd really be interested in the discussions among them since they hadn't been overtly political up to that point. I mean, in, in even in press conferences, I mean, they tended to skirt it until the 66 tour and then they began to talk a bit. But, um, but I wonder if there was any discussion among them about whether they wanted to get into that. And they, they must have been all behind it because not only did they agree to have it on the album? They made it the opening track. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, that was a statement. <laughs> mm-hmm. Didn't, you know? didn't, uh, I'm trying to remember, didn't George actually change the lyrics? Yeah. Didn't he were... say, uh, uh, when, when, when the, when he did it live, didn't he mention, did he, uh, who else did he mention besides, uh, Oh, Mr. he Wilson? updated it. Right. He mentioned, uh, George Bush. Meaning the first president, George Bush. Right. You know, it was ah, uh, uh, Mr. Bush, but I'm trying to remember who else he mentioned in there. Right. But. I th- I thought he I thought he updated I thought he had updated. It. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, he got very he got very political. I mean, that's not, un- that wasn't totally unusual for him. I mean, he did get political at times, but, uh, but that was that was a very significant political statement for him. Love you too is a was a. Very uh, again, go back to the, what you said earlier, Ken, about it being unique. That was a very unique title because it actually, in terms of English, doesn't totally make sense to say love you no. too. And so it was interesting in that respect, but also the you know, the song itself was was a great song. Um, as was I, I want to tell you, they they both are. Um, I think, and, it, I think it makes sense. I mean, from a certain perspective. I mean, if if um, I were to say to you, Steve, are you going to send me six hundred thousand dollars tomorrow? Uh, <laughs> or if you were saying, can I send you six hundred thousand dollars tomorrow? I'd say, love you too. <laughs> well, okay, okay. <laughs> but yeah, you do expect you, I... you do expect two O's on that too. And right, yeah. but he was, but he—that's not what he was. Uh, <laughs> I, I, if you look at the lyrics, actually, it, I guess it it does because he says, "I'll make love to you if you want me to." Yeah. Um, you know, so I says, guess. Go ahead. He says to you, he says, "I'll make love to you, not you two. Right. And, uh, right. So he says, "If you want me to," so he's basically saying, "Love you too." 
<laughs> but he's using he's using the word to rather than too, and here we are arguing about English. Um, when the main you know. thing about the song is that it's probably I think it's the first Indian instrument song that the Beatles did. Well, built around completely Indian musicians, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, as opposed to Norwegian wood using a sitar for a folk song, right? Yeah, just, just as a piece so, of color. But here it's here we take the next step into, okay, this is what this Indian stuff is really about. Well, kind of about, at least in terms of a, a, a short pop song. Mm-hmm. Mm. And then, what did and you then guys without... think of it when it came out? <laughs> what, did I th- what did we think of it? Yeah. I mean, oh, that's hard to say. I, to be honest, I remember uh, listening to it uh, listening to the eight track tape version in a in a uh department store after school i used to go to uh, this auto department in in a local department store and sit there and play uh revolver <laughs> <laughs> they didn't kick me out either but i that's what i used to do and i remember listening to the to the whole album there but i don't know what to say i mean it, the, the whole i mean the whole album is great i mean it's not i don't know that it's my favorite song on the album yeah. Um I mean I'm not I'm pretty sure that I had never heard anything like that at the time with those instruments and those kinds of sounds mm, and okay. you know and I think I mean it's uh, it's hard to remember cuz it was um like 52 years ago. Um mm. but I think you know that my friends and I were a little puzzled by it like what is this and is this like what are the Beatles doing you know? Well, the way he the way he the way he intertwined the instruments with the words, the way it started each day just goes so fast. I turn around, it's past. You don't get time to hang a sign on me. It's very different. It's not what we were used to on the radio back then. Right. You know, it was the be- you know it was the beginning of that whole you know that whole real real psychedelic turn that they made. You know, that was one of the first. That was one of the first steps, really. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I liked it. I mean, I don't remember not liking it. It was one of the earliest turns towards psychedelia that they had done, and it was it was definitely different from a lot of the music that we were hearing on the radio in those days. They were miles ahead of the of the Beatles. It was interesting in the interview I did recently with Mike Nesmith. He was talking about how far ahead the Beatles were, that they were just blowing everybody's mind completely. And it's it's the truth. You know, they really were. Um, and this is kind of an early indication of where things were headed. An early clue so, to the new direction. Early clue to the new direction, yeah. Yep. You know, in my case, I was a little kid when all the Beatles music came out. So even though I was enjoying it, I wasn't processing, you know, all these radical changes. I was enjoying each song as it happened. And I was noticing the uniqueness on certain songs, and certainly the introduction on Love You Too just stood out for me. What mm-hmm. other song starts out like that? Yeah. And the fact that you know an entire song was built around you know Indian instruments, mm-hmm. and I hadn't really heard that before. And then later on, you know, you go to love the melody, and it, it, there is something about George with this this negativism that he puts in his songs. Even going back to Don't Bother Me, his first song, but you know lines like. There's people standing around who'll screw you in the ground. <laughs> He's putting that mm-hmm. in this song. And um, at the same time, you're, it's very interesting what you said, Steve, about you know psychedelic and thinking psychedelic. Because sometimes I think a lot of people tend to associate psychedelic with the day in the life, tomorrow never knows, those songs, I am the walrus. But they may not associate the Indian stuff that way. And... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, it's it's part of it. It definitely is. Love You Too is definitely psychedelic, as was Within You, Without You. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I definitely feel that way. But um, just the whole idea of all that instrumentation and George, George Harrison and George Martin getting behind that and coming up with that whole arrangement. Same thing I could say about Within You, Without You. So, um, but this being an earlier example of it all and the fact that the Beatles were doing this, and George was so young writing a song like this, built around Indian instruments. It's just staggering now when I think mm-hmm. about it. Mm-hmm. 
Alan, uh, you have any anything else to to comment? Uh, no, I think I've, I've I've said pretty much what I have to say about that song. But you know, unless you sort of look at the three Indian instrument songs he did, there were only three actually in the in the whole Beatles canon, which were "Love You Too," "Within You Without You," and "The Inner Light." I think that the fact that he did three of them, I, I, I suspect he would have done a lot more of them if he felt that both the other Beatles and their fans and George Martin would allow it. And But I think that he sort of understood that you couldn't do too much. Um, I think he may have still been interested to some degree in conventional songwriting as his other two songs on Revolver show. Um, but mm. I, think what, I think what these three songs show really are, you know, he was not just dabbling in instrument in indian music he was really passionate about it and he mm -hmm. wanted to share his feelings about it with the other beatles with his listeners and you know the, I, I don't think any other group went that far i mean lots of people used a sitar and they used it more or less the way it was used in norwegian wood maybe a little bit spacier a little more psychedelic or but it's still an effect Whereas he's mm. basically saying in these three songs, um, no, it's not just an effect. There's there's a style of songwriting here. There are traditions of how songs go together um, in the Indian musical world, and I want to show you some of that because I love it. And, yeah, you know, and that was a, it was interesting for him to do, and I think it actually did a real service to you know for the world in a way because it turned us on to other Indian things. I mean, because he was interested in Ravi Shankar, I began listening to Ravi Shankar records just to see what it was about, you know? And, uh, you know, that's, that's, um, that's not nothing, you know? I mean, to, to aside, aside from selling your own song, to turn people on to a whole different kind of music is really, uh, you know, a great thing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, because he really, it, this was the start of world music mm -hmm. being right. introduced on a massive level like this. Right. right. And you got to give George Harrison the credit for that. Mm -hmm. Right. And he, he, I mean, he didn't, it wasn't just a fad with him. I mean, it was something that he, and, you know, that he showed was dear to him several times in his life. I mean, Bangladesh was another example. Um, you know the fact that the concert for George again had Rob, had Ravi there playing. You know there were and all the collaborations they did together. So um, right and and don't forget he he saved a lot of uh, you know his his desire to record Indian music for Wonderwall. Mm -hmm. That that um, there's there's a mixture of Indian music there and rock music mm -hmm. um, on that album. And then yeah he did produce some albums for Ravi Shankar too. Right. 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 Let's move to Sgt. Pepper and Within You Out Without You, which really turns the corner in terms of lyrics and music because the lyrics he got very deep in those lyrics. Um we were talking about the space between us all and the people who hide themselves behind a wall of illusion. Just those first two lines are are, are really a kick as far as you know, where he had been before. He really push the envelope in terms of where he, you know, what he was doing now. And the instrumentation on that song, which we've heard, you know, in the deluxe box set that just came out is, is absolutely stunning. And I'm glad that song is getting a little more uh, respect than it did. It was funny though, that he kind of did a little self deprecating thing to it. I, I assume that was him with the with the laughter on the al on the original album. That's uh, mm -hmm. that was uh, that's kind of. That, I mean, I suppose that's typical George uh, to do that. But mm -hmm. um, uh, Ken, well, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, <laughs> yes. I've said many times on this show that "Within You, Without You" is like of all the songs that I've come to appreciate so much more now than ever before. That's the one on every level. 
the marriage of the Indian musicians with the Western musicians and the orchestration, combining the two. And you got to give George Martin a lot of credit for that, too, not just George Harrison. But um, And it's fascinating to listen to the Sgt. Pepper, uh, the remaster, with George giving instructions to what he wants, mm -hmm. to the Indian musicians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I love that. And then lyrically, the fact that he came up with those lines, and you got to figure, this is 1967, George wrote this song when he was 24, and here's somebody who had the world at his feet. The four Beatles were the four most popular people on the planet. And here he is saying a line like, and to see you're really only very small. <laughs> you know, just to have the wisdom to know that you're just one of millions of people in the world, you know, and to have the Indian philosophy there nailed down the way that he did. And, you know, he was becoming more and more centered with that kind of philosophy. And um, the lyrics are so brilliant. The melody is great. You know, I just think that uh, it's such a stunning piece of music. It's a great song and it's a great recording. And on every level, I mean, this this was a progression at, um, you know, at its finest. You could say that about what John and Paul were writing at the time. I really f feel this way about George, although, let's face it, the later songs of George those are stunning songs too but when you combine everything else that goes into it you know all that instrumentation and the lyrics it's just this is a masterpiece to me mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. when i was younger i couldn't possibly comprehend this it was way over my head and now now i look at it as being beyond brilliant i think it was way over everybody's head back <laughs> back in 67 i mean yeah you, you know, know it was it was i mean uh, and, and especially having heard love you too um i know that um a lot of my friends were feeling like uh, okay what are we now gonna have one of these on every album and this one is five minutes long and you know but it at least it's on it's the first cut on the album so you could start the side two with when i'm 64 you know <laughs> and people used to <laughs> skip it um but george martin too has said that you know, he didn't like it that much at the time, and yet he produced a brilliant orchestral score to go with it. And mm -hmm. the, the interplay between the Indian musicians and the orchestral musicians is fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, but yeah, you know, that was one of those things that I think, you know, with both of those songs, Love You Too and This, George was really sort of way ahead of the world. And it took the world a long time to catch up and realize that not only is this actually not a bad song, it's really one of the highlights of Sgt. Pepper. And to be a highlight of Sgt. Pepper, I mean, you know, it's Sgt. Pepper, for God's sake. You know, that's something. But this is the, the development between Love You Too and This is also stunning. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say this. This is a far more sophisticated use of the materials and a lot more thought through, uh, simply musically, forgetting about the lyrics. But yeah, um, it really tells you something. How on the Beatles anthology they just released the um, the orchestration on on uh, volume two, that part without the Indian instruments, and on the remaster. They had just the Indian instruments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so you could separate the two and hear both and just see all the work that was poured into it. Mm -hmm. Alan, could you could you talk a little bit I mean we've I know we've gone through this before, but just a little bit of the the complexity of the arrangements on that song, could you kind of talk about that for you know, from a classical from a, a musicologist's point of view? Can you do that? If that's a tough question, you don't have to answer it, but go ahead. Yeah. You know, I think it's it's actually very apparent to the ear, and it's especially apparent to the ear once you've heard the um, the track on the deluxe edition that was released last year where George is teaching the Indian musicians what he wants. He's talking to them basically in their musical language, you know, using their names for musical syllables and... Um, and that kind of thing. And it's, it, it becomes quite clear that he's not just leaving it to them, you know, and saying, OK, this is sort of what the tune of the song is. And you guys come up with something good. Now, he's right in there. And 
I'd be interested in hearing what his discussions with George Martin were too, because like I said before, the interplay between the orchestra and the Indian musicians, I mean, they're sort of imitating each other in a way. The Indian musicians will play a phrase, the orchestra will respond to that phrase, not with the exact same phrase, but with, you know, with a logical musical answer, you know, uh, well, you know how the song goes, and and there is that long instrumental section where there is a dialogue really between East and West, and right. um, you know, and that's sort of the 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 interesting complexity that he gives us, um, because also it's it's not a dialogue between East and West, with the West being the Beatles as rock musicians, it's basically acknowledging that this is an Indian classical style and we're responding with a Western classical style. So he's the only Beatle on it, you know, but, um, but it was, you know, it was his moment on the album or his five minutes on the album. Mm. And uh, I, I'm, I'm really happy that they gave him the freedom to take that much space for mm -hmm. a song really this complex. Yeah. Yeah. Let's move on to Magical Mystery Tour and Blue Jay, Blue Jay Way, um, which I was very fortunate to visit a few years ago. Um, uh, and it's very, it's very exciting to to ride up that street and to you know to hear the or to see the place where that was inspired by that song, or that inspired that song, I should say. This is kind of like uh, Within You, Without You, part two almost, mm -hmm. um, as, far as, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I love the lyrics, uh, uh, you know, uh, especially, again, if you, if you see, uh, I didn't visit in, during the daytime, I, I, or at night I was there in the daytime, but to, if you see, it's a very hilly street. It's, it, goes, it goes up. Uh, there's a big incline there. And... Um, it's interesting to to see that, uh, but the, I, there was no fog the day that we visited, or no smog. At least I didn't see any smog. I didn't notice any. But um, I mean, it, it's it's a great song though. Uh, that uh, and you know the fact that uh, that he dedicated the the song to the street, uh, Alan. Yeah, to me, this one is not quite up to the level that he'd been achieving. I mean, he's basically it's basically just a song about waiting for his friends to turn up and they've gotten lost. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't really do an awful lot for me. It, it uses Indian elements in the sense of, say, a drone, um, except here it's played <laughs> on an organ. Well, I, I don't mean that as a, you know, the Indian instrument, uh, okay, in his Indian stuff, there's you know there's a drone instrument called a tambura, which doesn't play melodies. It just plays that like drone that mm -hmm. underlines it all. And here mm -hmm. he he has the drone still there, but it's being played by an organ, you know. And it's kind of interesting that he's taking some Indian ideas, but now we're putting it back in totally Western instruments. Um, uh, the non beatles sound in the song is really you know the cello mm -hmm. um, so you know there's some there's some interesting things in it but it's sort of not on the top of my george harrison composition list okay hmm. half the policemen on the street there's so many there to meet <laughs> <laughs> um ken uh, I love it a lot. I love the whole sound of the record. It's got the psychedelic feel to it, and I love all the the backwards vocals that you hear mm. in the stereo mix um, mm -hmm. that adds a lot to it. It's the whole arrangement of it, and like you said, Alan, the cello, you know, it adds a lot to the song. The melody is just so different. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's, I don't know how to describe it. It's, I think most of the song, at least the verses are all on one chord, built around one chord. And um, I think what George does with it melodically is just so unique. It's like a different melody from what you're used to hearing. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm talking about a distinctive style in his songwriting, which he had early on. And, and uh, you know, he continued with it then. And since they were doing psychedelic stuff then, like I on the Walrus, Blue Jay Way fit right in at the mm -hmm. time. Okay. Next is, uh, I'm going to pass uh, Flying, since that was a, 
written by all four of them, and go to Inner Light. Um, I love the Inner Light. Do you really? I really love that song. I mean, it is absolutely beautiful, and uh, but and and I think it was his first original on a single, and yet, much as I love it, it is probably the most pilfered of his songs. I mean, the text comes from is it's uh i think it's from the Tao Te Ching. Yeah, it is. Um mm-hmm. and almost exactly. I mean he changed a few things and uh but not that much. Um and the instrumental um my impression was that it was basically something the Indian musicians were playing when he was working on Wonderwall and he recorded it and put the lyrics to it. But now that we've heard the um, instrumental track that was on a bonus track on one of his solo albums and you're in the, the box set. Yeah. I'm not so sure about that. You know, I'm, I think, uh, I think you hear a little bit of interaction between him and the Indian musicians as you do in within you without you on the pepper deluxe box. So so maybe he did actually have more to do with the melody of that. But my impression before that came out was that this was a traditional melody that he fit the words to. But it's just it's just beautiful and it's you know, it's another Indian piece, but it's much more concise than within you without you. And um because it's, it has the Tao Te Ching lyric, it, it, it's, you know, definitely got this sense of ancient wisdom, you know. Without going Arri- out of my door, I can know all the ways of Earth, on Earth, you know. Arrive without traveling. Right. That's, yeah. Or the farther one travels, the less, the one, less knows. one knows. Yeah. Right, right. I always use that to get out of going places. <laughs> I didn't want to go. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. <laughs> but, you know. Uh, it wasn't always convincing to the people who wanted me to go with him. Uh, <laughs> I can. Your thoughts? Um, I could pretty much echo the same thing that Alan just said there. I think it's, uh, you know, I love the fact of the economy of the song that you can say so much and it's, you know, a brilliant piece of music in two and a half minutes. I love the words to it, even if George did pilfer it. You know, it really captures the Indian philosophy. Like we said, the farther one travels, the less one knows. You don't have to travel to know everything on earth you can figure it out all you know in your head and um you know it's 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 great uh, <laughs> you know it it's on the one hand i love within you without you because it's so brilliant all the work that was poured into it for five minutes and yet the inner light is also beautiful in its own way mm-hmm. being half as long so uh yeah i love it i i kind of wish and i wonder if you know now that we're talking about these indian songs do you wish that maybe George had done a whole album of songs like this? That would have been As opposed to Wonderwall music, which was instrumental, mm-hmm. but songs with, with lyrics. An entire album of the inner lights and within you, without you. It would have been so... Uh, I think at the time, I don't think the public would have caught on to it quickly. It would have taken a long time for, for people to appreciate it as they do now. Right. I mm-hmm. wonder if Olivia is sitting on any tapes. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Okay, now we go to the White Album, which really has a whole... Yeah. Uh, probably the biggest collection of Harrison songs there is. The ones that made the album, which would have been, you know, which were uh, While My Guitar Gently Weeps, Piggies, Long, 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 and Savoy Treble- Truffle. And the ones that didn't make the album, uh, Not Guilty, uh, Sour Milk Sea, Circles, and Dara Dune. So talking about the ones that they used, uh, obviously the the one that gets the most, you know, the most uh, uh, respect, I suppose, is While My Guitar Gently Weeps for obvious reasons, because it's such a wonderful song. And, you know, I'm so, you know, the, one of the great things... You know, you can say what you want about bootleggers, but one of the great things they did was put out that demo, the acoustic demo of uh, While My Guitar Gently Weeps first. Uh, that was an absolutely stunning piece of music, and I'm really glad 
uh, for those of you that have seen the love show that you get to hear that because obviously because they although it's not it, it's been as Alan was saying earlier they um, they've added things to to tracks in that show and they put a symphonic arrangement on that song but it's absolutely gorgeous I mean that that's enough to that's enough to make you uh, to put tears in your eyes, especially on that sound system there. Um, and then there's Piggies, which is a more you know George commentary, long, 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 which I, uh, I guess is kind of more is is a little George being a little more romantic. And then Savoy Truffle again is a little you know a little more um, sarcasm. Yeah, yeah, nice. sarcasm. Um, but anyway. Um, you guys I think the, I think the up... unadorned While My Guitar Gently Weeps demo is on Anthology 3, isn't it? Yeah. I yes. Think I think you're right. Yes, you're right. Mm-hmm. But I mean... It, it, Bootleggers we, it, got it, there it, first, of course. But... Bootleggers <laughs> did get there first. They did, they did get there first. But uh, yeah, I'm glad that they, that they put that out. I'm surprised that... Uh, I would guess that maybe, Ken, you play it probably, but I would think... Uh, but it's not something you hear... On the radio, on on you know FM radio, very often, and it's too bad because it really is, you know, a great version of that song. Um, I have heard it, but then that depends upon the radio stations that I listen to. But there's one station on Long Island that is a rock station, and they play a lot of uh, Beatles anthology stuff and demo stuff, and they do play that. And I hear more. The, the one that's on the anthology, just George and a guitar, more so than the love one. But, um, yeah, it does get some airplay, and certainly on Beatles shows it does. Mm-hmm. But that just tells you, I mean, uh, for a song that's such a classic, and what can you say about the White Album version with Eric Clapton doing the great guitar solo on it, and yet you hear it just with, with George alone on an acoustic guitar, and it's so beautiful by itself, just like that. <laughs> It's like, you know, it has a life of its own just as the demo. Um, right. It could have been released like that to begin with. And it would have fit on the White Album that way with all the other acoustic stuff that's on there. Right. So um, that was a stunning demo. It really was. But, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, certainly one of his greatest songs. And we may mm-hmm. soon hear another one if they put the Esher demos out on the White Album 50th Anniversary Edition. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I mean, we've heard it, but right. we may hear it officially. Right. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully, hopefully we will. Hopefully we will. Anybody want to say anything about piggies? I think that's probably one of George's best lyrics. Um, you know, because of the. Of, I mean, it, it, it's kind of it's like Taxman all over again. Um, but uh, you know, George's humor again uh, takes over. Um, yeah, and I, mean, I think was... that I think we get the humor musically too, because you know by adding the right. harpsichord to that, he is um, setting up a particular vision of a sort of stuffy end of society. I, I, I don't mean to imply that harpsichords are stuffy because I love harpsichords, but <laughs> but I think that I think that the picture he's drawing, you know, almost required that kind of formality because he's. Um, you know he's skewering that that part of society and um and, and and so musically i think it works really well too and sticking in the um the sound effects too with the, <laughs> with, the with the piggies ken well wasn't the song also inspired by animal farm i don't know the book animal farm i i think george might have said something about that hmm. but yeah social commentary right there and um i love the 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 humor involved you know what they need is a damn good whacking uh, you know lines like that <laughs> yeah. you know that, and according I do love to I Me Mine I think that came from his mother oh really <laughs> yeah yeah hmm. um, it's, well, I remember it, yeah, remember Piggies as well as While My Guitar Gently Weeps also had another verse too that wasn't used in the, the Beatles recordings mm-hmm. right right um, and then there's Long 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 mm-hmm. um which eh, I, I I don't that one doesn't you know doesn't uh, hit me real hard uh, for some reason. I mean it's a good song. It's just it, it in comparison to some of the other George Harrison songs, this one is kind of 
on a, a you know down near the the bottom of the the rung but i mean the lyrics are great uh so many tears i was searching so many tears i was wasting i mean it's a it, it, the lyrics are beautiful uh and you can only you can kind of guess where what inspired that um and very but, dramatic uh, drumming on it too it's right. actually mm. it's actually kind of a sleeper in a way because there's a lot going on in it but it's very quiet and subtle and um you know, I think the more you listen to it, the more it, it kind of reveals. Um, and, and there's also, you know, that sort of haphazard effect or accidental effect of um, you know, something that was sitting on the amplifier shaking and being caught by the microphone towards the end uh, that, that they decided to keep, you know, and, it, and it's kind of a, a neat sound. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Kind of like the feedback that I feel fine. Mm-hmm. That was a mistake, but um, but long, 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 you know, is another one of those songs that you could interpret as being a love song for a woman. But George did say it was about God. Mm-hmm. He mm. did say that. So, um, and he also said it was influenced by the um, the chord progressions from Bob Dylan's "Sad Eyed Lady of the Lowlands." Mm-hmm. I um, I love the fact that um, it follows Helter Skelter, and I think that it was intentional that you had such a loud, raucous song like Helter Skelter going into one of the quietest intros Mm -hmm. on Long, Long, Long. And then, you know, all of a sudden, this thunderous drumming from Ringo Mm -hmm. in his fills. I mean, that makes such a difference in the song. But I love the melody of it, you know, and I love that cool ending, you know. So I, you know, I, I like all the songs that George wrote in the Beatle years. It's hard to say that this is at the bottom, but, uh, no, I love the whole sound of it. I love the sound of his voice and how it was mixed. It's one of those songs that I that I appreciate more now than before. So okay, and next next is Savoy Truffle, um, which is a a nice a, it has a rock and roll beat to it and some great lyrics. You know, the lyrics are actually kind of fun to sing um, when you look at them. Uh, yeah. Uh, the lyrics are, are kind of are, are fun. Um, you know, in a way, it's a little bit like being for the benefit of Mr. Kite in the sense that John got a lot of the lyrics from the poster and George got a lot of the lyrics from a box of candy. You know, mm-hmm. the, the, all he, mm-hmm. he mentions all the different, um, you know, varieties of candy in this box. And um, uh, is, I think, what it's about Eric Clapton's Sweet Tooth. Ah. Yep. Yeah. And. He really liked chocolates a lot, and he had cavities a lot. So mm-hmm. George is making fun of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. And next is um, – we're, we're getting kind of close to the end of the list. Uh, Not Guilty from Anthology 3, which an is another – an outtake and an, also another – Another instance of George George's sarcasm. Uh, the words to that are, you know, are very. Uh, I don't know. I, I guess you could almost call them bitter because of what had happened. Uh, you know. Yeah, uh, there is a lot of that song reveals a lot of tension within the Beatles. I mean, because that's mm-hmm. just what it is. You know, I, I didn't mean to upset the apple cart. I mean, that's that's pretty open. You know, mm-hmm. um, and. Uh, you know, you get the the sense that you know, not guilty for making friends with every Sikh. You know, it's it's sort of like he's he feels as if he's being sort of blamed for Maharishi Maharishi and putting them off course. And uh, you know, although he at the time, you know, he still believed in the Maharishi. Um, you know, mm-hmm. he persuaded John that Sexy Sadie, originally called Maharishi, was was ridiculous. He he did not believe the Magic Alex stuff, and um, and and he continued to consider that valuable. And I think I think that the end of that, with you know John's sort of you know acidic approach to getting out of there, uh, I think bothered him. So it's. It's interesting. I mean, I could kind of see why it didn't make it onto the album. That's another instance where I would love to hear the internal discussions in the group about whether to put that on. Uh, But yet the fact that it went through 102 takes uh, or more, 
Yeah, that, that, that is kind. Of, that is kind of weird. Yeah, so they they oh. they sure did a lot of work on it, uh, and I like it as a track. You know, I like the mm-hmm. Beatles version much better than the solo version. Um, Not me. Do you, really, you know? do you really? Yeah. No, I. I... Yeah, definitely. George's version's better. I like that stinging guitar sound that he gets, and the, yeah. and, and the combination of the guitar and keyboard. It's I just like that. Um, I found I found the solo one a little lighter, you know, a little more. Yeah, oh, it's very laid back. Yeah, it's a mm-hmm. very laid back version. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The only thing about Not Guilty, I mean, it's got a lot of bite to it, the Beatles version, but that that guitar riff that gets repeated over and over and over, <laughs> it's it was really kind of overdone, mm. you know. I don't know if the reason why the Beatles didn't release it had to do with what he was saying lyrically. They may not have been happy with the performance that they captured. Mm. I think that that guitar riff was just way too repetitive, and it was it was more controlled on the the George Harrison version. Mm-hmm. I like that one much better. Hmm. Okay. The next three songs we're not going to discuss uh, fully, but they are Sour Milk Sea, Circles, and Dara Dune. Now, the first two uh, were uh, used on the, uh, done for the Escher tapes, which may or may not, we hope, will get released. And Dara Dune was in the anthology. Um, so let's move on to Yellow Submarine, where we have only a northern song and it's all too much and i adore both of these songs absolutely um and it was it was uh, i don't know if you can call it a life-changing moment but i uh several years ago when they re-released uh, yellow submarine the f- the first time was it the first time and i saw it at in um in san francisco seeing all too much in glorious uh, with the glorious stereo soundtrack was just um, absolutely amazing uh that was just fantastic and it's going to be great this time around too but those two songs uh in yellow submarine are, were just spectacular i mean only an northern song was was great lyrically i mean he kind of ribbed the the other beatles in it but all too much was just over the top fantastic i i absolutely love what he did with that and it's too bad that eight minute version or whatever it is that flo- has floated around on bootlegs doesn't get released. Really a shame. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ken? Uh, only a Northern song. I like a lot for the comical aspect of it. It's really making fun of the publishing company, mm-hmm. the music publishing company. I don't know if it was making fun of John and Paul. No, like I, you had said. I, I, well, no, I said it was just kind of, it, it was kind of, you know, elbowing the, the other guys. I mean, cause they were all involved with, with Northern songs too, but I, uh, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily say it was making fun of John and Paul, but uh, mm. it did, it did have, you know, he was commenting on the Beatles, you know, as a, you know, it was a Beatles thing he was commenting on. So go ahead. And it's all too much. I love to death. I mean, I look at it as being his, all you need is love. It's got that same, you know, universal theme to it. It's quite a, a great melody. Great arrangement. I love bringing the horns in too. I mean, um, you know, it, that that's what I think of. You know, it's it's um it's a great song by itself. It's hard not to think of the Yellow Submarine film when you're thinking about it. Mm-hmm. But um, it, it's it's a wonderful song. Mm-hmm. You know, all the world is birthday cake. So take a piece, but not too much. Right. right. Every now and yeah. then you get the sprinkling of these humorous lines in George's songs, and sometimes you overlook it. You don't realize, you know, the humor involved but uh later on you do <laughs> alan yeah yeah i like these two songs too i mean it, it, it only a northern song was a pepper outtake and i can see how it doesn't quite belong on pepper i mean it's a little bit dark um not so much dark lyrically because it's, it's humorous but it has a kind of dark late night kind of sound you know and it's it's sort of a completely different character from the rest of the stuff on Pepper. But, um, you know, I, I, I've always found it kind of humorous because, the you know, for, for people who followed the Beatles really closely, everybody knew that Northern Songs was the name of their publisher. And that, that in itself was, in, in a way, a kind of, you know, here it's, it, it, it's a pun, you know, it's a Northern Song, meaning... It's a song published by Northern Songs, or is it a Northern song because George, coming from the north of England, wrote it? 
making it a northern song geographically i mean in a way um you know there's a lot of uh, there was a lot of talk always between northern and southern england and the differences in culture uh you know even to the point where you know ringo when he's walking around during hard day's night and is being hassled by uh i guess the 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 female bartender uh he says a southerner you know it was there's that yeah. so um so there's that but uh you know it has that kind of nice spacey psychedelic effect but um really what gets psychedelic is the other one it's all too much i mean opens with that big burst of feedback um you know now we're using feedback way beyond i feel fine you know now we're almost into not quite into hendrix level feedback but more like that you know more using feedback as a, a a musical element that can be modified rather than just sort of you know with with i feel fine it's just the sound of feedback you know nothing is done with it but here he's got the feedback he's sort of uh hitting on the whammy bar so that it it, it wiggles a bit and then you get that that whole you know song with is as uh, you said the brass and the organ and all kinds of stuff and i agree that the eight minute version would be great um i think they should put that out somehow i don't know where they would do it but uh you know i guess if we have a 50th anniversary yellow submarine set which of course we won't um that would be the place well, they may but will be will we be around to see it that's the <laughs> the question <laughs> God, I shouldn't say that. Um, never mind. Um, in any event, um, let's talk about Old Brown Shoe, uh, which is, is such a, a great song, and, and um, it's got tapped on the back of the single, but it's a great song on its own. Um, Alan? Um, I really like the song, and I'm beginning to sort of realize as we go through these all together that um, one of the things I like about it is something I like about a great many of these songs, which is George's uh, use of different textures. Um, and in here we have the, you know, the piano that McCartney's playing. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's funny because the thing ended up on a B side and it was a while before it got collected onto an album. But, um, it was, it was a B side that you were really, really drawn to. And, um, you know, it's got a bit of that humor as well. I mean, Old Brown Shoe itself, I mean, the, the whole concept of that being the subject of a song, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it's just a lot of fun. And um, there's a lot of, you know, again, the, the textures, the, the bass line is incredible too. And um, I had thought that that was... Paul, because it's a very virtuosic bass line, but turns out mm -hmm. to have been George, right? Yeah. He did say that in an interview that he gave with Cream Magazine. I think that was around the time of Cloud9 mm -hmm. when it came out. So, um, yeah, it's a very interesting bass line, especially in that middle, middle bit, you know, during When I Grow Up, I'll Be a Singer, yes. that part. There's this really fast bass line. You know, do -do 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 -do. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, it goes like that. But uh, that, that's probably a, a little tricky to play, I would say. But would, it's really interesting. I would think so too, because you know, I mean, the the, the strings on a bass are so thick and heavy, and, and and to play you know that fast on them, that's why I always thought it was McCartney. But um, it's funny that you know he he very strenuously objected to the notion of playing bass when uh, when Stu left and they were trying to figure out which one of them was going to do it. Um, but he turns out to be a, a pretty hot bassist himself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. At various times, there were role reversals in the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, like John yes. playing bass on The Long and Winding Road or John playing lead on honey pie and Paul you know playing lead on tax man of all things yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so okay now we go to well, i didn't say anything about old brown oh, shoe i'm sorry say something ken <laughs> old brown shoe is a tremendous song uh, i love everything about it and i really think looking back now i don't know how successful it might have been but i think it was really strong enough to be an a-side i really think it was catchy enough and sometimes I think that maybe, just maybe, 
this song might have been influenced by Hello Goodbye, because Hello Goodbye is loaded lyrically with all these opposites. Mm. And it's the same thing with Old Brown Shoe. Hmm. I want a love that's right. Right is only half of what's wrong. I want a short-haired girl who sometimes wears it twice as long. There's all these opposites in there, just like Hello Goodbye was. But um, I love the whole... The whole build-up in the song, it's just its tremendous. I love the whole bass line. Uh, you know, it, just knowing that George played that, I find really fascinating. And uh, the drumming's outstanding. And I think I might not have thought about it as a B-side when it first came out. I probably listened to it more when it was on the Hey Jude album. And the fact that it was on 1967 to 1970, and I play that album a lot, probably made me appreciate it more back then. But I love it even more now. It's just one of those songs that really cooks. It really works great as a live song. I love the version on the concert for George, too, Mm -hmm. with Gary Brooker. You know, it really works very well as as a live piece of music. You know, outstanding song to me. Okay. Um, I'm going to move, we'll move on to Abbey Road and we will discuss probably two of George's greatest songs. And that's something, and here comes the sun. And something is is kind of an amazing achievement for George because it was recognized as a masterpiece by a renowned rock and roll hater, Frank Sinatra. And that, that in its own, you know, I mean, that's really stunning, but here comes the sun is also a great song, Mm -hmm. but something, the lyrics on something, I think that's the, that's the attraction for everybody. I think that's, you know, I mean, if there was, if there's a more brilliant love song, Lyrically than that, I, I don't know it. I mean, it's just, it's absolutely fantastic what he did with that song. And I've heard, you know, several versions. I've heard a fan of Sinatra's. I've heard many versions of him doing it. And he absolutely, uh, like I said, he was, especially in the 60s, in the early 60s, he hated rock and roll. He was, he always disparaged rock and roll, but he realized that this was such a great song and he recognized that. Even though at some point he got confused and called it a Lennon McCartney song, he right. he corrected he corrected himself later on. But uh, and he also he also used to uh, instill his own little style into it and use it, you know say Jack after some of the uh, after <laughs> the lyrics, um, you know. Uh, but uh, I mean, it, it, incredible. Here comes the sun too. I mean, that's that, that that's a, a very beautiful song. But anyway, uh, Ken? What can you say? I mean, I don't want to say this is the two greatest songs in George's career with the Beatles. They are two of the greatest. You know, I love the the whole body of work of all the songs that he did. But um, when people point to those two songs as being the highlights of Abbey Road, and I love all the other songs from Abbey Road, it tells you something. Something is one of the greatest love songs ever written, although he did write a lot of a lot of great love songs in his solo career, and I wish that some of them would get the attention that something has gotten. Something's just a beautiful piece of music. Lyrically, the bass line's fantastic. That comes from Paul. Although George, I think, complained that he was a little too busy on the bass on the song. Hmm. But um, everything about it, sometimes you, you overlook something like the orchestration that George Martin did on that. Because you're so wrapped up in the song and how beautiful the melody is and everything else, and George's iconic guitar solo. But um, everything about that, it's a, it's a perfect package. And Here Comes the Sun is so brilliant in its own way because it's actually a very complex song, at least I think so anyway, in terms of its musical structure. There's a lot of different uh, time signatures in it, and um, you got to give a lot of credit to the band and especially Ringo for his drumming on Here Comes the Sun. And mm-hmm. it's very interesting drumming altogether. That's great drumming on something. Yep. Don't overlook that as well. You know, there's so many great things you could say about all Beatle records, but um, so Here Comes the Sun is also a stunning piece of work in a lot of ways. I love the sound of the acoustic guitar on, on that song. So wonderful. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> what uh, can I say? Here yeah, comes, Alan? Here Comes the Sun uses in some ways the same trick as if I needed someone with that D chord, you know, um, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, obviously goes in a completely different direction. And, uh, you know, I, I agree. These are two incredible songs. And since we're talking about George's development, I mean, if you look back to the beginning of the list and cry for a shadow, don't bother me, you know what to do. Yeah, he has come an immense 
distance, you know, in the like five years between those early songs and something. And here comes the sun. Uh, something, I mean, I, I, uh, I agree with a lot of what Ken pointed out, the orchestration, um, everything else, the bass line. I, I have a feeling that his comment about Paul being over busy on the bass line may have been sort of an echo of uh, Paul's criticism of George's original idea for guitar uh, lines in between the lines of Hey Jude that Paul rejected, um, mm. <laughs> which worked when Wilson Pickett did it, by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I have to say um, what really put it over for me, I mean, I always loved something, obviously, but um, when The Love Show was going to open. I did an interview with Giles Martin um, at a recording studio in New York, and he brought his hard drive and played the music from his hard drive. And so we're talking about really no generation loss and no compression for CD or anything, but right from the master tapes to his hard drive. And you could hear, you could hear the pick on the guitar strings. You could hear you know, to the orchestra sounded so exquisite. I mean, that was really one of the highlights, you know, of that, actually of that afternoon listening to these things. Um, and when I wrote the piece, um, after I filed it, the editor said, can you, um, could you say a little more about what it, what it was like hearing this stuff in the studio? <laughs> and, and I said, yeah, it was really the, best time I've had while fully clothed. And she said, I am not putting that in the New York Times. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, those are incredible songs. And, they, and what, in the context of this show of ours, what they show is this incredible distance he came and, uh, and also, you know, looking at the middle of the list, I mean, the, the amount of variety of things he did for the, with the Beatles is, uh, is really stunning. Mm -hmm. Not that we're at the um, end of the list, but no, no, we're we're almost at the end of the list. Um, chronologically, those are the end, right? Because what we're well, we go to to let it be. Those things be, were done right. before Abbey Road, right? Right. Although um, I Be Mine was done. That's after. true. That's true. <laughs> okay, so actually, yeah, we are down to just about the end of the list with uh, the Let It Be album with For You Blue and and I Me Mine and. Um, both of those, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know if I after after what he did with Abbey Road. Well, again, we're talking about two the songs before Abbey Road. They're both great songs. Uh, um, they're both kind of similar uh, in the way that um, they're you know stylistically similar. Um, I, I do like them both. Uh, I mean, mine I like for the lyrics. Uh, for you, Blue, I just like for I like for the music. Uh, so, uh, Ken. I like both. Well, I wouldn't say they're great songs. You know, For You Blue is a fun song, good blues number, you know, built on, you know, typical blues chord progressions. Mm -hmm. But it's a fun track to listen to. You know, it's fun to hear Go Johnny Go, you know, <laughs> George right. saying that in the middle of the song there. Um, I mean, mine is very biting. I, I love the song because I think that, um, you know, it has an edge to it. Although you know, we do know that they had to extend the song by repeating the same verse over so that it would be over two minutes long kind of like i'll cry instead the longer version in a way mm -hmm. but uh yeah i like both those songs it i i want to keep trying to not associate it with all things must pass because most of the songs on all things must pass the album i like more than those two songs so but they're good they're very good songs. And, you know, strangely enough, he ran through so many of the songs from All Things Must Pass during the Let It Be sessions and couldn't manage to drum up a lot of interest among the others. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and even I Me Mine. I mean, uh, he played it for them. It's in the movie. Um, and that's why they had to recall the Beatles uh, on January, was it January 3rd, 1970? Um, yep to come in and do it and and john was away so he's not on that john is actually not on a number of george's songs um, that's true and towards the end yeah and uh you know i think uh you know they just decided that since you know that worked 
cinematically uh, to have I Me Mine in there. They had to have him come in and do it or have them. And uh, and they came in and did a, a really short performance that, as you say, had to be looped. But it's a great song. And it, um, you know, it's a little bit, I associate it with Not Guilty in a way. You know, I don't know that he's talking about the other Beatles necessarily, but given... The squabbling and you know all of this is I me mine all through the day I me mine mm-hmm. I me mine I me mine it's uh, I I could see how that might have been what he had in mind um, but of course it applies generally to a lot of people in the world um, mm-hmm. so uh, yeah I, I I'm glad that it ended up in the film and therefore required a finished recording because the finished recording is actually pretty good looped though it is Mm -hmm. okay well it looks like we have gotten so caught up the time has has run us by and we're going to tell you how to get a hold of us first of all you want to get a hold of the show um you can write to things we said today radio show at gmail.com we have a Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fan Facebook page. And also thank Michael Lynch for composing the theme song for the show. And to get a hold of me, you can write BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I have a Beatles group called Beatles News and Information. And I have a little piece of news. You will soon hear, uh, if, for those of you that are Monkeys fans, I will be on an upcoming episode of Zilch, the Monkeys podcast, talking about my recent interviews with Michael Nesmith and Mickey Dolenz, which, by the way, both of them talked about being at the Pepper Sessions, and maybe we can discuss that at some point down the road. But in, in any event, um, Alan, how can people get a hold of you? Um, probably the easiest way to get a hold of me is on Facebook, where... I am two places. Uh, I have an Alan Cozen page and an Alan Cozen remix page. So either of those will get to me. Okay. Uh, Ken, uh, how can people get a hold of you? Uh, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. And be sure to visit my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. As I mentioned in every show, there's weekly Beatles trivia where you can win one of nine prizes. And I have a brand new prize to give away. And this one is especially nice. We talked about this in a previous show. Just reissued the four complete Ed Sullivan shows okay. with the Beatles. And uh, that's a two-DVD set. It's got all the performances from the four shows, three from 64, one from 65, all the other acts that were on the show. So you can watch it the way that many of the first-generation fans watch the show and experience it as it was first broadcast as well as the the TV commercials, too. That's part of my trivia page. And I also want to make a quick mention that this coming Saturday, which is June the 9th, I'll be one of the MCs at the Fab Four Music Festival at the Oakdale Theater in Wallingford, Connecticut. There'll be 20 acts from New England, Beatles tribute acts performing, 10 indoors, 10 outdoors. I'll be either the MC or one of the MCs for the outdoor shows. So come and say hi if you can. All right. Thank you, Ken. And thank you, everyone, for listening to us and looking us up on YouTube and Podbean and wherever your uh, podcasts are found. For Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen, this is Steve Marinucci saying thank you for listening. And who knows? We will be back before you know it. See you next time. <laughs>